Can I welcome everyone to the 22nd meeting of the Education and Skills Committee in 2017? Can I please remind everyone present to turn their mobile phones and other devices on to silent for the duration of the meeting? Apologies have been received from Oliver Mundell. Michelle Ballantyne is substituting for Oliver. This is Michelle Ballantyne's first appearance at the committee and the first item of business is an opportunity for Michelle to declare any relevant interests. Michelle? Yes, just to let you know, I'm a sitting councillor on Scottish Borders Council and I also have involvement with voluntary sector children's services supporting children with additional needs. Thank you very much. Uh, the second item of business is a decision on whether to take agenda item four of business in private. We're agreed. Thank you. Uh, and uh, agenda item three is an evidence session with the SQA. The committee has done a fair amount of work in the performance of the SQA in the last year and we felt that now would be a good time to hear again from the SQA for an update on its work. And I welcome to the meeting Dr Janet Brown, Chief Executive, Linda Ellison, Director of Finance, and Robert Quinn, Head of Qualifications Development, English Language, Business and Core Skills from the SQA. Good morning. I understand that Dr Brown wishes to make a short opening statement. Yes, thank you very much. Uh, good morning, everyone. Uh, thank you for the opportunity to come here today to provide an update on the activities of the SQA. And I want to particularly focus on the actions we've taken in response to the committee's report on the performance and role of key education and skills bodies. We've taken action to both review our approach to engagement and communication with teachers and lecturers, but also to use the opportunity afforded by the revision of the assessments of national qualifications to streamline documentation and accessibility of this material on our website. A significant feature of these changes has been closer engagement with those who need to use the information, namely teachers. This has been to ensure that we more fully understand how we can best structure the essential and support materials that are, that are there so that they can both be easily found and, clearly, and are clearly worded. Both the documents themselves and the structure of the new web pages have been user tested and feedback from these activities used to make further improvements. All documents for a National 5 subject can now be accessed through a single web page. These documents are now more precise and clearly worded, with, for example, the course specification for National 5 maths being reduced by almost 60%. Those involved in the development of the qualifications assessment and the materials and events that support their delivery are predominantly teachers, whether they are the principal assessors, members of question paper setting and marking teams, subject implementation managers that are involved in supporting teachers, or those seconded from schools to work with SQA as, a as the revisions to assessment are undertaken. These people have recent and direct teaching experience in delivering qualifications. Strong engagement with and response to the feedback from teachers, parents and learners remain a key focus for us. SQA receives a significant amount of feedback on all of our work, which we carefully consider. This feedback can often be very positive about the nature and content of the qualifications and about the changes that we are currently making to the assessment of national qualifications. As is the case with the submissions to the committee, however, some of the feedback that we receive raises issues and concerns, and the points raised are carefully reviewed and discussed and actions taken. But we also commission independent surveys of our customers and these findings are all also used to improve the way we work. In May 2016, we published the results of our own field work on how the qualifications were working on the ground in schools. And this identified several areas that needed to be addressed by the wider education system and highlighted some of the workload for both learners and teachers that were associated with unit assessments. While SQA instituted revisions to this to address this for this session, for the previous session, 2016-17, further planned changes were superseded by the decision that was recommended by the Assessment and National Qualifications Group to remove the units from national courses. This has been completed now for National 5 and work is ongoing for the hire during the current session. A follow-up review was undertaken and the findings from this work were published earlier this month. The feedback from senior management in schools, teachers, parents and learners themselves provide valuable insight into how the senior phase and qualifications are perceived. This fieldwork report will inform the discussions that are taking place at the ANQ group, particularly around National 4. We hold web webinars on specific subjects where teachers can participate in live sessions or watch on catch-up TV 
at a suitable time for them. 18 have been held so far and a further 11 are scheduled. We continue with the Understanding Standards Support Programme. SQA has a dedicated team that works directly with every school in Scotland, visiting schools regularly to address concerns or arrange for specific subject support at a local authority or an individual school level. I want to reassure the committee that while significant progress has been made, SQA will continue to find ways to improve how we communicate and engage with teachers and other stakeholders. We have a programme focused specifically on sp supporting our customers that is bringing together groups of teachers, lecturers, parents and other stakeholders to help us develop new approaches to ensure effective, timely, efficient and valuable engagement with SQA. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Dr Brown. Um, I'll kick off with the, with the first question, which kind of touches on the first two themes that we want to talk about, the development of the national qualifications and communication with teachers. The new national five qualifications have been taken in this current academic year. How confident are you giving that communication and relationships with teachers was, was a, an issue that was raised at the last session, that teachers understand the changes and what, more importantly, I suppose, what work have you done to take the profession with you in these changes and to make sure that that information gets to them? Um, given the time frame that was available in terms of the development of the revisions, we used uh, a, a significant amount our national qualification support teams to engage with us in terms of the revisions that were being made. The membership of those support teams are uh, made up of practicing teachers and professional associations and others, uh, other stakeholders, and we have actively uh, worked to ensure that, though, that there is appropriate representation on those. So that is the way we've engaged in terms of making sure that um, we got feedback on the changes that were being made. In terms of the communication of the changes themselves, uh, we have um, initially, just straight after Christmas at the start of this year, put out a high-level uh, notification on what the changes were likely to be. And then subsequently in April, the detailed changes were uh, published at that point. Um, we have been publishing during the course of the summer further information and we've been, been engaging at a school level through our liaison managers and also at a subject specific level with key organisations and other teachers. We've also uh, uh, engaged with head teachers across the country in terms of the types of work that, was, that we are doing and the nature of the changes. I don't know if Robert wants to add any more to that. Yes, the only other thing I would add is um, we've also... Um, We've, we now have integral to our teams, our qualification development teams, um, a, a, a type of post called a subject implementation manager. And these are usually secondees from um, colleges and schools who um, are um, experienced staff in delivering the, national, the existing national courses uh, and have a strong insight into the changes um, that we're taking forward in terms of National 5. And these subject implementation managers do a lot of work around the country um, uh, sometimes with groups of, of, uh, of teachers within a local authority or sometimes they're, they're in individual colleges or, or, or schools. Um, so, for example, um, just, just, just in the last day or two, I've um, had feedback from one subject implementation manager who's been speaking to um, principal teachers in Highland Council, Glasgow City and, and in Edinburgh College. So um, uh, that's another part of the, a slightly more informal mechanism for, for rolling out um, uh, the changes and to ensure that people are, are happy with them. Um, we'll obviously follow that up with, the, with, with a number of, of, of uh, events and, and, and further uh, webinars, question and answer webinars, for example, which don't have a, a fixed defined agenda. But, you know, in modern languages, for example, we've, we've taken some feedback from centres around some areas that, that leads us to think, well, let's run a Q&A webinar that everybody can log into and we can, we can have an open agenda. So it's, it's actions like that that we're trying, both for, informal and formal, that we're trying to use in order to get closer to the teachers uh, in order to ensure that they're comfortable with the, the changes. Thank you for that. They, they, we will be coming on to communication. Uh, I'm sure there's lots of questions that the, uh, the committee want to ask about that, but I want to open up the questions up to the development of the new national qualifications. I can ask the panel that when you're asking questions, not to veer into the other areas because there'll be members that are already uh, want to ask a question on that. Let's start with Liz. Uh, uh, Dr Brown, when you were at committee in November last year, you said that Scotland needed to have a national conversation about uh, National 4. And uh, you're in the middle of that conversation just now. Could I ask you to be very specific with us about the concerns that have been presented to you by teachers about National 4 and how SQA are addressing these concerns? 
Um, the national conversation is taking place under the auspices of the Assessment National Qualifications Group, and SQA has undertaken some research in terms of the second portion of the fieldwork that we undertook towards the end of last year and the beginning of this that was just published earlier this month. Um, and that was very much to talk to senior management teams within schools, with, with teachers within schools, but also importantly with learners and parents about their perceptions of National Four. And uh, the report very much highlighted that there was not only a difference of opinion uh, across the country about how National Four was operating, but also a difference of, of opinion within um, local authorities and also within schools across subjects. So there's a variety of different uh, views on uh, the nature of National Four as it stands today and the nature of what National Four might need to be if it were to be revised. Um, uh, the, the, those opinions vary from um, the, the fact that they that uh, both learners and some teachers felt that uh, not having an exam for National Four was an appropriate way of doing it, uh, as it prepared people for a different pathway, potentially going into college and other vocational qualifications that are internally assessed, whilst others felt that the lack of an exam particularly in examination, was an issue that needed to be addressed. There was definitely a consensus that there needed to be some form of differentiation uh, at National Four. Uh, currently, there is a pass, and there is th th that is the, the, the way in which National Four is certificated. So there was a consensus view that there needed to be some differentiation, but not a consensus view on what the nature of that differentiation should, should be. So all of that work and all of, all of the detailed um, feedback that we got from those different groups um, will be fed into the Assessment National Qualifications Group. And the next time they meet, we'll, they'll be discussing that along with uh, uh, other pieces of input to decide what the nature of the future for National Fall should be. Is it ac accurate, Dr Brown, uh, as to what's been reflected in the press and anecdotally to uh, mem members of this committee, that quite a substantial number of teachers feel quite strongly that National Four is not in the best educational interests of quite a large number of children. Is that an accurate reflection of the feedback that you think you've had? The, the feedback report re that we got um, showed that there, were, there was a, a significant proportion of teachers who felt that there should be some form of external assessment, and in some cases exams, uh, at the end of National Four. I think it's likely that that will, that will change, that there will be some form of uh, examination in National Four. I think that's a matter for the A and Q group to discuss as to how the, they wish to approach um, the changes if there were to be any to, to National Four. And it's a topic that I think will be uh, of great debate in that discussion. Just on the related issue, uh, obviously some of the changes uh, that have been made were made on the basis of feedback that teachers gave you that they felt that their workloads were extensive and that obviously John Swinney had made a commitment to unburden that. Take that aside, do you believe that the National Four and National Five structure is educationally sound for the best interests of our pupils in uh, S4 and S5? Uh, National Four is set at SCQF Level 4 and there are candidates that will achieve that and then we'll move from that into other types of um, education or directly into the workforce. There, there is absolutely a requirement for a qualification at, at SCQF Level 4. Uh, the nature of what National 4 needs to be, the content of it, um, uh, is something that has been built upon uh, um, the, the broad general education, the curriculum levels that were associated with um, the experiences and outcomes. I, I think the discussion as to the progression from National 4 to National 5, progression from National 4 to other forms of, uh, of qualifications at either a CQF Level 5 or, or a CQF Level 4 is something that really needs um, uh, the teachers to be able to be uh, individually thinking about in terms of the customization for the, for the individual child and the individual student as to what is the best direction of travel for them. So for me, I think um, it, it's important to recognize that part of Curriculum for Excellence is about personalization and about making sure there are appropriate pathways. Um, we, we spend a lot of time discussing <laughs> National Four and National Five. There are a large number of qualifications at SCQF 4 and 5 that might actually be a better pathway for some learners uh, and for many learners. And I think that's, that's something that we should be thinking about. I think Robert probably wants to add something to that. Just to say, we do see a lot of, of very innovative practice at that level, SCQF level, 
not just National 4, but other qualifications, and sometimes combining National 4 with other qualifications. You know, for example, and, and again, using a languages example, that we have a Modern Languages for Life and Work Awards, the SCQFs 3 and 4, and some teachers quite innovatively combine that with the work they do on National 4 and involve local employers like um, Halcro or um, Holiday Inn or whatever, so the youngsters can see the absolute relevance of what they're doing. And, and also um, the, the, the freedom that personalisation and choice um, with the, these type of qualification allows the, the, the youngster to take forward. So I think that point about we should, we should we need to be careful we don't become over-focused on just national courses and that national courses are the only show in town. I think at all levels we want the senior phase to be a mixed economy of provision, qualifications and other experiences that people can engage with. Um, and National 4 is part of that. Uh, I understand that, Mr Quinn, but you know, one of the great concerns that this committee was presented with was the fact that when it came to the uh, management board for Curriculum for Excellence and obviously the qualifications that feed into that, there was a concern about who makes the decisions and where the accountability lies. And over the summer, uh, there's been a great deal of discussion about National 4 and its accountability and who has the, the decision-making power about whether that will uh, change as a qualification. And you know, I think this is quite an urgent uh, point. It certainly is an urgent point as far as many parents are concerned, and certainly as teachers are concerned. N National 4 does not appear to be working in the best interests of quite a number of pupils. And I think that's quite a general feeling amongst teachers. And I'm really keen to try and ascertain where SQA is on this, because I think it's a very pressing issue in schools. As I said, the, the decision as to any changes that would be required for National 4 would be taken through the A&Q group, and then SQA would be, would be charged with implementing those changes. So that, that's the point that we're at right now. Uh, we are providing that information, and there will be a very detailed discussion at the A&Q group, which I think the committee is familiar with the membership. Uh, that includes the professional associations, School Leaders Scotland, uh, ADES, Education Scotland, Scottish Government, etc. So there's a variety of voices around that table that would come to the decision as to what the nature of the changes would be, and then SQA would be tasked with doing that. Uh, my, my, my last question is just to ask, is SQA providing advice on National 4? Uh, uh, do you have an opinion as to what should happen? One, one of the things, well, the reason we did the field work is because there is such a variety of opinion about what should happen with National 4. And one of the things we, we will be doing is giving the pros and cons of the different options that would be available. Joanne, then Tavish. Did you not regard yourself as having a role in actually coming to a view, um, given the field work you've done? I mean, I think you know, this is a big issue. I feel very much that you're saying it's like a dispassionate well, on the one hand, on the other hand, there's a lot of people got a lot of views in this. You need somebody to be driving it because while there isn't a decision, there are young people, in my view, are being, are being failed in the system by not having a qualification that will be regarded externally as reflecting on their abilities. Yeah, absolutely. SQA is, is a key part of the ANQ group and we will be providing that advice and guidance to that group. You said already it would be pros and cons. Do you have a view? And if you have a view, could you share it with us? Well, I think, I think it really is a decision as to what is the nature and the requirement of what National 4 is, is to be. The, the, there, there are a variety of different um, positives about internal assessment. There's a lot of positives around uh, not having an examination but having some other form of external assessment. Externally assessed coursework, for instance, is, is, is an aspect that uh, is seen as a way in which candidates can demonstrate what they can do in a different way. An exam, ha you, you've seen in the press the, the variety of opinions as to whether an exam is good or bad for candidates. Uh, and, and I think that is something that, that needs to be thought through in a very careful way. With respect, if we thought that, that would be something we would carry out across examination qualification. But we're seeing somehow for people who are... Um, working at the level of National 4, they don't need external ass assessment, but nobody's suggesting at higher or advanced higher level there doesn't need to be external assessment, although the same pressures exist. And I wonder, I, mean, I just want to know, I agree with you that lots of people have lots of opinions on this. What is SQA's opinion, given, for example, from one perspective, originally, Curriculum for Excellence didn't intend to remove the external qualification, and that way back in the day, Munn and Dunning said certification for all meant you could then ensure that resources went um, in a fair way across the cohort of young people. If you don't have an external examination, the chances are that the resources that you need, the resources will be di directed elsewhere. So I suppose in simple terms, 
going to the meeting to make a decision, will the SQA come to a conclusion about what should happen? Not reflect what everybody said to you, but on the basis of what's been said to you, will the SQA take a view into that meeting? Uh, can, can I just also add, though, that at SCQF level 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, there are qualifications that are purely uh, assessed through either course through, coursework or internally assessed, externally verified. And, and, and it is only higher, um, advanced higher, that have, and National 5 that have exams. So there are very, very high credibility qualifications that are not associated with examinations. So logically you would argue that higher and advanced higher should be the same then? I mean, if there's a problem it, with external examination, it applies at all levels. I, I think there, there are advantages to uh, examinations and it specifically uh, can also be di in different subjects. So di some subjects are very um, appropriately dealt with in examinations such as mathematics. In other subjects, it's very difficult to do an examination, such as dance, where it's performance related, etc. So it is a subject specific issue as well, and we've reflected that in, in the National Five and higher and advanced higher courses in terms of the nature of the assessments that's undertaken as well. Thank you. Just a couple of supplementaries to, um, that uh, flow from that. Firstly, Dr. Brown, on your field, on the point you make about field work, does that field work include an assessment of where? Um, young people who uh, take national falls then go. Um, we have the, the field work was undertaken by going to schools and asking, trying to find out how the qualifications were operating within the school. So it did not go into the destination of those candidates. And has anyone within the great system that is our education uh, world worked out where young people are going once they've done, once they've passed or not passed national falls? Part of the Insight programme, which is what the Scottish Government runs in terms of the measurement system for curriculum for excellence, is looking at destinations of students. Looking at it, but, but by the time the assessment national qualifications group meet, presumably they'd want to know whether, in assessing this qualification, where young people are going. And, and that's part of what we would expect to come from the representatives from the schools and from local authorities and from colleges. Okay, but on the accountability point that all my colleagues are raising, who is doing that work and will it be presented to this group at the same time as you're presenting your evidence on whether national force are working or not working? Th that will come from others around that table. Okay, so mm -hmm. let me try and again. Who do we ask to make sure it's happening? Uh, well, I, I, I would say that I, I, I know this is, this is not a matter for SQA, but I think it is local authorities and schools and the insight group that is there to look at the destinations okay. of the students. Uh, but in your assessment that you've just been asked by Joanne Lamont to explain as to whether these are working or not, do you not think a big part of that is where pupils are then going after they've yes, done a national fall? Yes, absolutely. So why is it not your work then? Why is it not part of your field work? Would that not be a, an essential component of your assessment that, you, that you're going to make to the group that you've been describing this morning? Um, we are part of the system that runs Curriculum for Excellence. Yeah, and, we get that, yeah. That is, that is not a piece of work that we have currently undertaken. We would be happy to undertake that if that is something that, that is regarded as, some, as, as the focus for SQA to be doing Okay, but your advice to us would be to ask local authorities as to, and, and schools. Yes. But there's, in that sense, there's no national picture whatsoever being built up of... And the insight, or the insight tool is there to understand... So I don't know what the insight tool is. I'm just an MSP. I don't, what is the insight tool? Sorry, it's, it's the current measurement system that the Scottish Government has put in place to measure the effectiveness of the curriculum for excellence, which takes account of not only national qualifications attainment, but other types of qualifications, the destinations, positive destinations, and a variety of other measures. Okay. So if I put insight into Google, will it tell me where all the people who've gone through National <coughs> Falls have gone to after they've completed I don't think it falls. will at this point in time. Okay, no. so we don't know the destinations. On I, the think, I think we are, we are currently in the second year of um, yeah. the final, sure. uh, of, the, of the full senior sure, phase, sure. and it's, yeah. it, it's early days yet, okay, but that right. is the plan. Do, to other questions, if I may, Mr Chairman. Uh, firstly, who chairs the, the group? Who's currently the chair of the group of the, of of the, the assessment group. national qualifications group? Yeah, uh, the deputy first minister. Okay, so it'd be a decision ultimately taken by the minister as to whether these, this changes or not. The changes that Liz Smith was yeah, asking you about earlier on. Chair, yeah, yes. no, that's fine. And finally, on the time scale, um, when is it likely to make a decision? I read various things in the last month which suggest that this could be a three-year process. Is that fair, or what would be your understanding of when, if there are to be changes to national falls in terms of the points being asked, raised about uh, external exams, uh, when would those? When is it envisaged those changes might happen? Um, again, the A and Q will, will, group will be deciding 
when those changes will come okay. to place. When does it next meet? Um, I am not familiar with when the date has been set. It's, it's in the current... Um, Will it be this I'm, year? Oh, yes. Yeah. yes. <laughs> Thank you. Before I uh, ask Daniel to come in, just a question about destinations. Would it not be the case that schools would know who's left school before the end of the, the, the term or who's moved on to employment or moved on to college, more likely? Uh, so that information is there. It's just a case of it's not centrally collated. Would that be what Tavish was getting at? I, th I, think, I think schools will know that, that, candidate, that students have left. I think they, that where they've gone to is, is something that needs to be collected, actively collected, and that is part of... Um, the plan in terms of understanding positive destinations. So, yes, it's not at a national level, but schools will have their own information on that. So, would they, would they then pass that information up to the council? Robert, the local authority? To... Yes, I mean, normally, I've been in a centre before, normally there's a survey of, of, of people who leave at the transition points, you know, to try and discern what, what their destinations are. Um, and then that's, that's collected and reviewed at either a local authority level or if it's a college, a college level or whatever. That, that's, that's the process. And certainly in terms of, in terms of uh, national four, people who do national four qualifications progressing to other qualifications, you know, that obviously we, we have that information. So I think that's, we have a part to play in, t in terms of that. And I think it's also important to recognise that people are not just national four candidates and national five candidates. Quite often candidates are doing a mixture of national four and national five. Um, and, I, and, I, and the candidate voice as well is, is an interesting factor in, 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 in all of this engagement and their perception of, of, of their load and, and, and the worth of the national four and progressing on. But certainly in terms of qualifications progression, in terms of the, the mixed mix of qualifications that the youngsters do afterwards, we, we've got a part to play on that. Uh, schools, local authorities, colleges, etc. at the various transition points should, be, should, I think, be collecting destination figures. I think the there should be more of a focus on destinations in Scottish education, less of a focus on absolute attainment. And I mean, I don't just mean in relation to National 4, I mean in relation to higher hires as well. Um, so I think that's... Only looking for part of them because you've already got the information for the, for the other... Uh, School, the, the people who are going through that force and stuff, you've already got that information if they've moved on to some other educational destination. If there are so other qualifications, yeah. if there are other yeah. qualifications, we, you know, that potentially could, should be available. Certainly within the subjects, we can see the progressions, right. but there, there also might be more information in relation to other qualifications. Okay, thanks for that, Daniel. From, from this line of questioning, um, we focused a lot in, in terms of the concerns around National 4, um, around assessment, and progression but but I think the concerns aren't limited to those things I think one of the key concerns I've heard from teachers around deliverability especially teachers charged with delivering national four and five in a single class and if I may just the, the key example from that that sticks in my mind is a physics teacher who was telling me that both waves form the, the the part of the syllabus for both those qualifications but for nat four it's sound waves that they teach whereas nat five is EM spectrum which is just not compatible is that compatibility uh, an issue that you are looking at, examining and seeking to resolve? I think as we look at the revisions of National 4 and, and understand what the requirements are with, and how it's operating within schools, some of, the, some of the nature of the content would probably be something we would look at in terms of... Uh, it, it, it is a different level of complexity at 4 versus 5. Uh, the challenge is if, if we are seeing significant numbers of schools delivering in um, multi-level teaching, then I, th I think we do have to start looking at some of the content. The challenge as soon as we start looking at the content is we'd, we would change again. So, you know, we, we would have to change the content of either four or five to be able to have that, that, uh, that, blend, that blended learning to be able to take place. But, but that multi-level teaching was something that was um, explicitly contained within the old regime of standard grades that you would treat, you t whereas it sounds as if the, the current National Four and National Fives were were designed in isolation, is that? The current National 4 and National 5 were not designed along the lines of standard grade. They were designed as a progression route, either to college or to National 5. So, so no consideration was given to how they might be taught by the, the, a, a the, single teacher in a single classroom? The way in which Curriculum for Excellence asked for qualifications to be designed was very specifically for progression from 4 to 5. And, and we, we did not do the same as, as was in the previous system. We are seeing teachers using the current qualifications as they had used standard grades in the past. And that is one of the issues that we need to look at. So, so they aren't, my interpretation of that is that deliverability wasn't taken into account? No, I, 
Robert, do you want I mean, just, to just to clarify, the, 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 the qualifications were organised in, into what we call units or modules, if you like, and, and they were set up hierarchically. So the intention was to try and, as far as possible, um, set up the situation where um, uh, th there was a hierarchical progression from, from the different SCQF levels, level four to level five to level, level six. Um, but in some of the science areas, my understanding is there was there was some challenges. Although the unit titles were were similar, it was the same broad area. There was some differences in content. But I think the uh, the intention um, was to organise the uh, uh, courses uh, in, into organisers called units. They have now been removed, so we're now reevaluating that and and having other um, organisers within the courses and taking into account the deliver deliverability issues. OK, I, I, I know how I'm interpreting that answer. I mean, I think another key concern is around breadth. So since 2014, we've seen a, a decline of around a quarter in terms of the number of presentations for, for modern languages. If you compare that uh, with the old standard grade regime, uh, you know, broadly between National 4 and 5, that's a 60% decline in, in the number of presentations. Is, is that something that you are concerned about? Um, is that uh, the, the, the breadth of qualifications being taken in categories of qualifications, subjects? Is that something that you're you are looking at and, and, and uh, how that, you know, the, the examination structure regime uh, may contribute to those uh, trends? I think um, this, we've discussed this before at the committee in terms of uh, the number of qualifications that that candidates are taking and and the associated changes in the in the pattern of qualifications. I think one of the things that um, that we need to understand is whether that is as a result of people um, bypassing a particular level, for instance, and moving straight on to higher, which was one of the aims of curriculum for excellence. It's also associated with the nature of the other types of qualifications that are available. Roberts highlighted some of the other languages. Uh, qualifications that, and, and awards that are available in schools. Um, we, we monitor that, we look at that, uh, and we give uh, that feedback to um, Education Scotland, Scottish Government and local authorities in terms of the nature of, um, of the presentation pattern for particular courses. I think you, you also have to take into account um, the potential changes in the school role change as well that's happening, but also the philosophy with CFE that it wasn't about cramming uh, three years of successive qualifications into senior phase. It was about diffusing that through the course of the, the three years, the full three years of senior phase. Um, and I think those taken together mean that there has been a change in the number of students undertaking qualifications at S4, for instance. I mean, some of those factors may account for change, but you know, even if you combine bypassing um, and other qualifications, we're moving to a situation where um, out of a cohort of you know, uh, around 130,000, only around 20,000 are taking uh, languages, and that, that seems to be a, a whole category of subjects that, that are simply you know, not, not being taken by, by, uh, you know, by, by people at school. Um, people leaving school without any qualifications in, in, in languages at all. I mean, is that not a situation that would be of concern? Yeah, I, I mean, uh, <laughs> in terms of SQ's position in that, we want all language qualifications to flourish. We want young people to engage with languages. Um, the fact is, at the moment, that previously under standard grade, um, um, English, maths and a foreign language were, were compulsory. That is not the case now. So the, statistically, the only way that can go is, is, is down when you, when you give a degree of option and choice. Our, from our perspective, we want to try and retain as broad a breadth of provision of languages as possible. Um, and also, um, it creates some other qualifications provisions that um, ca can be engaged you know, uh, within, within the schools. So the Modern Languages for Life and Work Award, for example, had 3,000 entries last year. Um, and um, some people were taking that, that qualification in lieu of a, of a national course. It's a much more flexible uh, qualification, um, but it gets, still gives people an insight into languages and, more importantly, how they can use language in, in a real-life environment. So, yes, I, I agree with the sentiments you've, you've expressed, and, and obviously we would want more people to engage with languages, and our aim is to, is to continue to provide as broad a base provision as is, as is viable um, in order to meet with, with that. Finally, I mean, are you going to are you undertaking that that broad macro view as to you know, what is the total level of, of, of kind of language attainment in, in schools in terms of 
uh, taking into account alternative qualifications and bypassing, and then looking at that aggregate picture as to you know, what, what the situation is in, in terms of modern languages in, in secondary schools? Certainly, we can provide that information, that, that data and that information. Um, and yes, when we review our language provision and we look at the success or otherwise of the language provision, we take into account the totality of that provision, not just the national courses. Thank you. Uh, Michelle? <coughs> We've talked a lot in, in the course of today about moving on and going from N4s to M5s to hires. But all of these things, all these stepping stones, ultimately are about leading to the world of work. And I wonder what kind of engagement have you actually had with employers, particularly perhaps from the smaller end, the SMEs, who are, who are going to be many of the employers for youngsters who leave at um, certainly at the N4 kind of level. Because I, I think there's a, a lot of confusion there now. And actually, a lot of employers are telling me that, that, that they are going to devise their own assessments when they're trying to recruit people because they, they, they really don't understand it anymore. So, so what are you doing about that? Um, during the course of both the development of the original curriculum for excellence qualifications, but also the revisions. We have a programme where we engage with businesses and we communicate with businesses as to what the nature of the qualifications are. Um, and we, we, have, we also work with parents' associations to make sure that parents and, uh, are, are aware of the nature of the qualifications, the nature of the changes, and uh, what the qualifications are aimed to do and what the potential progression pathways from them are. Uh, but working with employers is an absolutely critical part of what we do, both in terms of developing the content of what is in the qualification, uh, particularly around uh, not, not necessarily the national qualifications, but the other qualifications around developing Scotland's young workforce, making sure that the nature of what is in the qualification is relevant to employers. The whole issue of core skills, which Robert has a... Um, a particular focus on is about making sure that candidates who take our qualifications have got that basis that would enable them to be successful in work and one of the challenges is making sure that um, we have that strong engagement with employers to do that. Um, we work closely with the Federation of Small Businesses in terms of the SME population as well in, in that case and the CBI etc. And are you confident that you can meet what they're asking because obviously we've had a false start and, and you're now revising it did what they tell you was akin to what you decided to do the first time round, or are you moving towards something that they asked for now? Employers are um, relatively familiar with internal assessment, with units, and with uh, taking uh, not only uh, new employees, but their current employees through skills development in forms that um, uh, are, are at college and that, that are in a very similar framework to what National 4 is right now. So, so they were very familiar with that and were very comfortable with the approach that was being taken. I think what we've seen over the last couple of years is an increasing concern about how National 4 is perceived across the board, and we need to go back and have that further, on, uh, further discussion with them on that. Okay. Thank you very much. Uh, I'd like, now like to move on to discussing communication and start with Ruth. Good morning, panel. Thank you for, for being here. Communication was one of the, the themes that, that came up um, the last time you appeared before the committee. I think there was quite a lot of reference made to jargon and um, language. Um, you spoke in, in, in the opening statement about close engagement with, with teachers and strong engagement. And I guess I'd just that, like to ask you, you know, quite simply, what does that look like? What, what's that? Who are you speaking to? How are you speaking to them? How are you acting on it? And how do you know it's working? Robert, do you want to start that off? Yep. Um, I mean, con constant in engagement with teaching is, is is our mantra in terms of in terms of qualifications. The people we work with who who develop and, and maintain qualifications are, are teachers and lecturers. Um, and we've taken quite a lot of steps to try and reach out more closely towards the, the wider um, um, uh, balance of teachers who, who are not directly involved. So, so as I said earlier, the, 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 the new post subject implementation managers who are out in the field, as well as the, the customer liaison people, subject implementation managers are teachers themselves. So they're teachers talking to teachers, and that's a wee bit different from the, the liaison team who are excellent, who are primarily the voice of SQA, but these people are, have got a, a two-way communication channel. So we can use them as a benchmark. So when we are thinking about how, how, will someone how do we want to frame a piece of uh, guidance in a particular subject, 
or a piece of advice, or we're getting a lot of feedback from teachers that they've not, they want more clarity around something. How do we make that, that clearer? Then we've got that ready av available benchmark of, of, of uh, teachers who we can use to actually um, uh, road test uh, any communications that we have with them. I think that's a really valuable resource over the last year or so. It's something that we've really tried to, to and indeed in some, in some areas we're trying to further strengthen that, particularly areas where, where, where we need to maybe provide even more support and, and clarity. So that, that's, that's, that's one example. Sorry, uh, how many of those posts are there? Sorry, it sounds quite jargony, the title, to be honest. I mean. the, yeah, OK, so it, we could have, um, you could have a qualifications manager who's an SQ member of staff, usually with a, a, an education and teaching background. Um, and within that, that person's team, um, we will second uh, a subject specialist um, so, so uh, in modern languages, for example, we have two, two subject specialists who we've seconded into SQA um, uh, who can go out and, and work with and speak to, and speak to teachers. So, so they, they bring us closer to the teaching profession. Um, Can two members of staff have? How much, how much ground are they, are they covering? Well, quite a lot, quite a lot. I mean, we, we have in, in, in some areas we have, we have um, I mean, quite a lot. They can, they can, they can, they're free to go out and, and engage with local authorities. They can um, meet with colleges. Um, um, you know, I think, I think it's a, a significant investment. And, and you know, so in, in, in some areas, um, you might have a qualifications manager who looks after, you know, three or four uh, high profile subjects, but they will have individual subject implementation managers attached to these so that that can that is can be quite quite a, quite a rich resource um, if they use their time wisely I, I think the other aspect that we've we've undertaken is we, we've specifically held workshops as teachers to say this, this is how we are thinking about restructuring our documents this is how we're thinking about ensuring that our website's more accessible um, and and basically engaging them and and getting their feedback as to whether what we're proposing is a valuable way forward or whether it's something that we should stop and completely rethink. Uh, we've had some very strong feedback on our website, as you could probably imagine, and we are taking both short and medium and longer term actions to try and address that. So there's a variety of different ways in which we engage with teachers. I think what Rob is highlighting is the fact that um, we, when, we, when we're writing the documents, we not only write them now from the perspective of what needs to be in them, we also get teachers to read them and come back and say, is that that logical can is that easily understandable uh, we we have um, removed a lot of the jargon uh, uh, from a lot of the uh, a lot of the subjects and I think if you look at the new national five documentation it's a lot more streamlined that will happen again this year for hire it, it, it's a real so focus I wanted to ask you again sort of specifically about that I mean you say that um, there's an example in, in your evidence of one that's been reduced by 60 percent um, how do you know that this has worked for teachers? What feedback have you had and, and what further measures have you taken if there's been other well, changes to make? Go on, Rob. Well, again, I mean, we, we road tested these, these revised specifications with our subject implementation managers and we also spoke, spoke to teachers via our, our, our um, national qualification support team and other wider wider teacher networks. The key thing to, to achieve that reduction was le learn lessons. To, to a degree, there was, there was a number of standard statements jargon, if you like, you know, that, that kind of repeated itself across a number of documents. Um, and, and what we've done is, and therefore, I think these things, uh, uh, when you read them, they're edu educationally appropriate statements to have, but when they keep repeating themselves on an ongoing basis, um, teachers have to wade through them in order to access the, the information. So taking a step back from that and getting feedback, you know, we, we've stripped a lot of that out so that when a teacher reads a course specification now, they can get to the heart of their subject uh, right away, as opposed to reading through a few pages of broader educational aims of, of, of the development, which are all very laudable, but don't get to the, the meat, meat of the matter. So I think that that was the strategy that we tried to put in place in order to achieve that. That's worked. That's well, really feedback, feedback from, from, from teachers. When, when, you know, if we're up speaking to Highland Council or Glasgow City or Edinburgh College, then, you know, we, we asked them, we asked them for feedback. <coughs> You know, the proof in the pudding will be when we, when we sort of, you know, move, move it forward. But that's uh, what people are saying to us, that is they like, they like the, the reduction in jar jargon, the increased brevity, and also where it needs to be, the instructive nature of it. You know, um, there are aspects of guidance which are important and autonomy, and we, and we value that, but there are also some things that we have to say, this is how you do it. 
and we've tried to be a wee bit more instructive there. Okay, thanks. Tavish, you wanted to come in on that point, yeah? <coughs> uh, Dr. Brown won't thank me for this, but um, last November we, we had a, Kavina uh, will remember well, a, a presentation or rather a submission from a physics teacher who said uh, in, in on, on the higher physics unit and assessment, there were 81 pages of guidance across five different documents, three accessible on the main SQA website, but two on the SQA secure website. I take it that's all rather better now better for National 5 and it will be better for higher. We have we have redesigned all of the pages, so all of the links are on one page now. Yeah. But when we do the revisions of the uh, of the assessments for higher, we will be addressing that as well. But if you go back and you, you look at National 5, it's very different. National 5, is, it's yes. pretty well sorted, but and for we, higher, yeah. for, so for teachers teaching higher physics, there's still a bit of this challenge in there? The, there's that... still a bit of the challenge, but it's all in one place now, so okay. they can access so There's the, one website. The, and, and yeah. The, yeah. Well, the, there's one set of links. Right. We are, our longer term uh, approach is to develop the, the, the single yeah. sign-on and everything okay. else that and will make it easier for teachers And in, on, on Mr. Quinn's point, there's now not 81 pages of guidance. I take it that's been rather stripped down to what really matters to a higher for, business For National teacher. 5. For National 5, but yeah. for a higher... higher it will be done this year. Right. That's, that's, we're taking advantage of the revisions to assessment yeah. to refine our documentation. Okay. Right. Thank and you. It's, a good, it's a good opportunity to do that. Absolutely. Timely. Absolutely. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, before I bring in Claire, can I just ask that, um, and, and it touches on what uh, Ruth was talking about, you said you get feedback from teachers, but have you got any plans to make uh, an evaluation of the, the communications, the changes in your communication strategy to see how effective it is? Yes, um, we, we commission on a regular basis a, a, a company to do independent surveys for us, and we will continue to do that. I think we've, we've highlighted that to the committee in the past. Right. Thank you very much, Claire. Uh, thank you, convener, and thank you, panel. Um, thank you for your submission. Um, but I'm somewhat concerned that in a 15-page document, there are two mentions of parents in that document, uh, one of which was about improving the search experience of your web pages, and the other one was about um, materials that schools can adapt for the use of pupils and parents. I can't hear, or I'm not hearing from the panel this morning, of much engagement with parents who are key to this. Um, so tell me, how do the SQA engage and communicate with parents? Um, part of the fieldwork that we've just published and, uh, and in last year's fieldwork, part of that was absolutely talking to parents and hearing the voice of parents as to how they felt their, um, their children were doing in terms of the, the, the qualifications. So that's a significant portion. Submission, and I've not heard any of that this morning. Why uh, is that? Because we were focusing on the specific questions, uh, maybe it's an omission we should have included more on, on our parental engagement, but uh, I would like to reassure you that we do do it, and, and in the fieldwork report that was published earlier this month, you'll see a specific section on parents and carers. Uh, we, we very much work with um, both major parental organisations to make sure that we provide materials and work with them to provide materials that are appropriate and meaningful to parents because we recognise that the types of documentation that are on our, our website that are valuable for teachers are not necessarily um, as valuable for parents and therefore we've, we've got a, a, a significant programme working with them. Um, and. And we work, we, we also meet on a regular basis with the parental um, bodies to understand what, they, what they're doing. And they also sit on SQA's advisory council. Um, you also, uh, you said in, in your submission that as a means of engagement, and again, there was, n there was nothing in here about parents in terms of your means of engagement, um, that you made visits to schools in 2015-16 uh, to 16 and 2016-17, to 17, follow-up visits in the, in the, the later years, um, to look at gaining insight into teacher and pupil opinion. So where's the parents' opinion there? That's what I was talking about. I mean, I, we, we obviously omitted to add the, the word parents and carers in there, but as part of that second portion of the fieldwork that was done in 1617, there, was, there were parents and carers and um, uh, very deep discussions with them on the nature of how they felt that the qualifications were operating. And, and the report highlights the feedback that we, were re we received from parents and carers on specifically the same sorts of questions we were asking teachers, senior management teams and candidates. 
So do you not think, given that you're back here to uh, tell the panel, tell the, this, uh, the committee rather, about how well you're communicating that this is a glaring omission in your evidence of your engagement with parents that you're not telling the committee about? We could probably have done a lot better on doing that, yes. Uh, right, we're going to move on to uh, marking and invigilation of scripts and exams. So, uh, start with Ross. Uh, convener, for this year's exam diet, the SQA decided that uh, the papers would be withheld for 24 hours after the exam and then released. I was wondering uh, how you consulted with teachers and students before making that decision? Uh, we made that decision in response to a series of events that occurred in previous sessions. Um, and uh, we, we felt that we had received complaints associated with specific posts being posted during the course of an exam, and we took that, um, that action to try and address it. We have reviewed that action and have decided to change that policy to um, what had originally been the case but was potentially not being uh, implemented as much, which is that the examination papers will be made available at the end of the school day after all candidates had undertaken the qualifications. I'm glad to hear that that decision had been reversed because the feedback I received was that it was increasing rather than decreasing anxiety. But given where we were last year, where this committee went through with yourself, the issues of teacher trust in the SQA, the breakdown in communication, why did you not consult before making this decision? The EIS said it was a, another example of an apparent lack of trust that the SQA had in teachers that further damaged uh, your reputation in their eyes. Why, why did you not ask them before making that decision? I think, that, I think there, there, there are lessons for, for us to learn in that, definitely. I think there is also the issue that we need to ensure that um, we, we have an appropriate mechanism that ensures that all teachers uh, and all candidates are given a fair um, experience on, a, on an exam day. Uh, one of the issues that we had heard was and, and had evidence of was inappropriate use of examination papers during the course of an exam, and we needed to address that, and we needed to address that pretty quickly. We, ha we did not consult, you're absolutely correct, and we probably should have done, and we have sub subsequently consulted, we've subsequently done a review of how Christian papers are handled in schools. We've gone into many schools and we've done a lot of audits to understand how we can best change the policy. And that has resulted in us change, changing our approach for this coming year. So we did learn the lesson that we did not consult and we went back out and talked to teachers and, and, and did a survey of, uh, and went into schools during the course of the examination period to understand the implications of any changes that we would make to the availability of exam papers. That's very positive to, to hear. I think part of the issue was the language used in your communications when, um, I think it was in response to media inquiries explaining why you'd made that decision. The phrases that you used around inappropriate postings, many teachers felt were accusational. Have you had any review of your communication strategy in terms of the language that you're using? Um, it, we, one, of, one of the things that we, we, we've talked a lot about um, SQA taking uh, a stock of how we communicate and how we engage with teachers uh, and the broader stakeholder community, including parents and carers. And, and one of the things that we, we have done is try and understand uh, when we need to be directive and when we need to be supportive and when we need to explain things in a much better way. There are occasions, as, as, as Robert has highlighted, where we need to be clear and directive on how things absolutely have to happen in order for secure certification to occur. But we also need to be very cognizant of the nature of how we communicate. So we have taken action on that. Thank you. Thank you, Ross. Gillian? Coming back to our discussions of November last year and the recommendations that the committee gave to the SQA out of the the uh, discussions that we had then. Uh, point 28 on our recommendations to the SQA, which I'm sure you'll be familiar with, was the SQA's core business is producing and marking exams. Errors in these areas are unacceptable, and the committee is concerned that Dr Brown suggests that errors occur because of excessive workload and has presented the solution has been more work on quality assurance. So we've urged you to consider how to, to re-prioritise your resources to address these issues, and I'd like to give you the opportunity to tell the committee how you've done that. 
One of the things we, we very much did this year is introduce additional quality assurance processes on the nature of the question papers, and I think the committee will have noticed that they were that we withdrew, we, we, we replaced one examination paper this year, uh, but there were no other errors within the system that, that uh, addressed any, any concerns. So w one of the things we did do was introduce, um, well, I think the previous year uh, we, we discussed the fact that we had introduced additional quality control mechanisms associated with specifically the sciences because of the complexity of those papers. We've rolled those changes out across the board and we've introduced additional quality assurance procedures both in terms of uh, the nature of the development of the question paper, but also in the nature of the, the actual printing of the question paper as well. Picking up on one of the things that was mentioned there was excessive workload was something that you said was a reason behind the, the errors of, of previous years. How has that been addressed? Well, one, one of the things we have done, um, because we are, we are in the midst of doing the revisions to the assessments, is we have added additional staff in terms of being able to um, take some of that work and, and spread it across the piece. Robert might want to cover that. Yeah, I think a, a kind of practical example of that is narrowing, narrowing the number of examination papers or assessments that each qualification manager is responsible for. Um, so there is less absolute pressure on, 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 that, on that individual, if you like. So um, we broadened the qualification staff teams. So um, each qualification manager now has a narrower range of, of subjects or exam papers, um, w which obviously allows them to f allows us collectively to, to focus more on quality. So we've increased the size of the teams effectively, and increased yeah. uh, and decreased the number of specific subjects that each individual one is responsible for, yeah. which allows them the time and the space to be able to deal with that. Because mm. one of the criticisms that, that came back, um, anecdotally from from people after your. Um, your comments on this was about how the SQA is actually operating internationally as well um, and that that might have had an impact on your core business of actually uh, overseeing the qualifications regime in Scotland. How would you answer that criticism? So you go into the international stuff later on, Joanne's yeah, got a specific sure, question sure. about Yes, that. I will. I have another question then. Yeah. Yeah, um, coming back to, I've got the official record of the, the committee meeting um, in November, and it come back to a question that I asked at the time, was about the recruitment of um, markers. And that had been a, a, a problem in the past. You haven't been able to recruit enough markers, and you hadn't been, there was criticisms that you hadn't been able to recruit uh, markers with enough experience. Um, I believe it's three years teaching experience that you require before someone can be a marker for the SQM. Are correct in that? Yeah, three, three years. Um, we don't count. We don't count the probationary year. So yeah, two, two years. Yeah. 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 So could you confirm to the committee that every marker that is marking for the SQA has had three years' experience, at least? Yes. When when we when uh, appointees register with us, they def they tell us how much experience they have, and we only accept teachers that have that level of experience to become markers. Another thing that was mentioned, um, again, out, out with the committee, but with, with teachers that I know who had been markers, was that the system, the computer system, where they're actually marking online, had been quite difficult to negotiate. They were often getting locked out and having to phone a helpline. Has that been, been streamlined at all when you've been looking at your other uh, computer issues? Yes. Yes, one of, one of the things we do every year is we review how um, our marking system has operated and we will make revisions for the following sub uh, subsequent session. Um, we did have one, one issue this year which was associated with um, markers who were using Apple computers. That was associated with the supplier and that was dealt with very, very quickly. Uh, we have a system in place that allows markers <coughs> to flag to team leaders any issues that they're uh, finding that, uh, that are then addressed as quickly as we possibly can. But we do make incremental improvements during the course of the programme. So getting back to the, the, the number of markers that you had, did you have any issues this year? I know you had issues the previous year in getting enough markers. Was, that, was there an improvement there? In there was the an improvement there. We put in place additional recruitment mechanisms mm -hmm. um, to, to make sure that we had the right number of markers and we, we were not short on markers last you year. You were not short. And we're starting the, the, uh, currently in the process of beginning recruitment for the 
for the following session. Yeah. Last year, I asked you about, and I, I was corrected by you by calling them appeals. I know they're not called appeals anymore. It's post results services, I think. Um, Ruth's going to be laughing at the jargon there. But um, forgive me if I lapse into calling them appeals, but was there a decrease as a result of the measures that you took to improve the marking and to have more markers recruited? Was there a decrease in the amount of schools appealing the results or going to the post results services? We're in the process of uh, finalising that right now, and we've seen a slight reduction, but I don't have the final figures with me. Okay, thank you. Uh, yes, point of clarification, Dr Brown, um, it's my understanding that if there is uh, some form of dispute over a request for a marking review, um, that you're not in a position to uh, let the papers be seen by the candidate. Um, could I ask what the justification is for that? Because in other parts of the UK and other countries, that does happen. And uh, given some constituents that write to us, I think it might be helpful if that transparency was in Scotland too. That, that is currently the practice, that um, we do not return scripts. One of the challenges has historically been the nature of the, the, the fact that you have one copy of a script. We are now moving to a different environment where we have electronic copies of scripts and we will be consulting this year on um, changing that policy if Good. the system requires it. There is a variety of opinions, again, um, across the country as to whether or not that is a good thing to do. It, it, it's just from an integrity point of view, it helps the transparency that, you know, it, it, it's, been historical. it's been a historical procedure. Up right, good, it's good to hear. Okay, right, thank you, Liz. Hey, Tavish, are you wanting to come in on this one? Yeah, thank you, Kavita. Can I just ask a couple of questions about the pass, how the SQA set the pass rates for, uh, I'm principally thinking of higher here, um, and how much those alter from year to year? Um, I was told that PE, higher PE went up this year. Um, you need to keep me, correct me if, I'm, if I've got this wrong, um, but went up more than the, by more than the normal variance of, say, 2 or 3%. Again, please correct me if I've got the numbers way wrong here, but um, uh, uh, in other words, was it a statistically significant change in that particular subject? And if so, why? Do you want me to do this one? <laughs> um, I, what, as, as the committee is aware, what we do in the grey boundary meetings is we review the nature of the assessment, we review how that assessment has performed, and if that uh, assessment has been too challenging or too accessible, we will adjust the grey boundary appropriately. It is not associated, the adjustment is not associated with um, the pass rate at all. The pass rate falls out of the discussion around w w what the, where that um, grey boundary should be set. Uh, in the case of PE, um, I, I am trying, I am, I, I, I I'm not sure of the exact criteria that was, was in place, but that is the, the mechanism that we have. So we would look at uh, the, 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 natures of, the nature of the assessments, because it's generally more than one assessment, that um, um, combines to make the final pass mark. And, and what we would then do is, is adjust the grey boundary based on how each component of that final assessment will have operated. And Dr Brown, that normally those, those adjustments would be fairly small in terms of a percentage change, you know, 51, 49, rather than by 10%. Yeah, one would, well, yeah, normally that is the case. Yeah. There are exceptional cases where you would see something happen that you needed to address and it's, and the grey boundaries are there to address to, that. To address that, okay, thank you. Daniel, do you have a question here? I, I you think, okay. thank you. Uh, right, well, we'll move on to the Capital Investment Programme and International Activities, Colin, do you want to talk about it? Um, I do want to ask one or two questions about resources, but can I just ask a general one first? On page 10, paragraph 3, um, it says that this year conferences were held in Inverness, Dundee, Stirling, Edinburgh and Glasgow, attracting 357 delegates. It doesn't sound like many delegates for five events. Uh, sorry, are, are you specifically talking about the... Um <coughs> SQA coordinator events. That's right. Yes, there is a coordinator for every school or every centre in Scotland. So it's it's not each teacher that um, that we're inviting to the coordinator events. Each school so you has expect one from each school. Yes, yes, and there's around I think 430 secondary schools in Scotland. Sorry, how many? Around 430, I think, secondary schools in Scotland. 
Okay. So th th those events are more about. Or, um, the people that, that help coordinate all the data that's transferred between SQA and centres, etc. It's the kind of coordination role as opposed to the right. qualifications role. So that, that's what those events are for, and you know, managing requests for information from SQA and marking reviews, all that type of stuff. Okay. Back to money. Um, I notice that uh, you're saying you intend to invest in your IT systems, which, from my experience in the public audit committee, brings sort of a cold sweat given other public uh, IT programmes. What, what exactly are you intending doing? Well, what we, what we are doing, uh, and we've been doing this now for the past two or three years, is we are evolving, not radically moving from one box to another box. We're evolving our IT systems. Um, uh, our, the current um, system that exists within SQA has been in place since the um, late 90s, 1990. Uh, and, and one of the things we need to do is we need to um, bring, uh, bring our systems up to, up to speed and up to uh, the efficiency that we need them to be to enable us to do some of the things we're talking about in here in terms of engagement, in terms of transparency, in terms of giving people access to our systems. So what we are doing is taking functionality. We're, we're taking some of the things that, that, that the current system does and putting it on uh, other other smaller systems and building up a modular system. So we are not buying a brand new gigantic system. It's very important that we don't do that because, because like you, we, we absolutely have to be aware of uh, minimizing the risks to anything that we do within, within SQA. So we, we are currently in the process of um, moving some of the things that our, our uh, legacy system has been doing uh, onto a corporate business system, which is, which is what Linda is currently uh, working on. Um, and that is to, to de-risk the, um, the main system. So we're slowly moving things off uh, uh, in, a, in a very controlled, very managed way. Hmm. Who is actually managing the project, you know, in terms of uh, input from Scottish Government or whatever? Um, uh, Linda and uh, Linda Ellison, who's the Director of uh, Finance, the Director of Business Systems, and myself have met with the Scottish Government um, Chief Information uh, Officer, and we are in regular communication with them. And we have used the templates that Scottish Government advise in terms of programme management for major IT changes. So we are fundamentally doing that. I think Linda wants yeah. to add something to that. Um, yes, it's essentially we have um, spoken with Scottish Government, but we have taken forward a, a paper to them, a proposal on how we will make that shift our IT strategy, if you like, our change programme strategy, but essentially about de-risking and about moving transactional type data from the big main system. So everything that we hold about candidates, all the exams, all the qualifications, all the units sit in, sit in a, a single system that's a number of systems called APS. And what we're doing is looking at how do we de-risk that system. So our new corporate business system, which will run all of our back office services, but will also do all of our transactional um, activities to do with all the, the 15,000 appointees that we work with and um, the teachers who get payments from us who draw expenses from us and um, we are moving that on to the new um, if you like back office service system involved in this or is it all in-house um, the system itself is, is a new software system ERP system um, it's it's called Agresso. It's it's a Unit Four Business World as a supplier. It's used by a number of public sector bodies, um, but we are using um, a contractor to help us with that with that implementation. Yes, we are. With, with, uh, but one of the things we we have been careful to do is make sure that we have good program management of all of that. Yeah. Uh, and one of the things we've done is, in discussions with Scottish Government Information Department, is, is make sure that we look at their recommendations, and we do that on a regular basis as to what we should be tracking um, and make sure we are tracking those things. And, and, and we have a monthly meeting that monitors the progress of this. Uh, and we have um, a, a project manager who's specifically dealing with it. So it, it is not something that an organisation whose business is data takes lightly. Uh, SQA is a data organisation. That's what we do. We have to do this carefully. What's the cash value of the project? Um, over its lifetime? Over its, well, the, the submission that we gave to the Scottish Government was actually a spend-to-save submission. So we, we will be spending around 
in total three million to four million pounds over a five year period. But we will um, be securing savings as we progress through that that we demonstrated because we've moved some of our um, our office systems on to a new a new system. So we've, we've actually we've moved to Microsoft and we are securing quite substantial savings through that move, and that's helping to fund some of the other changes that we're making. Just to labour one piece, uh, you are aware of the successive failures of various yeah. IT projects, and I know yours is a yes. bit smaller than some of them, but hopefully you've seen the lessons from that. that that's one of the reasons why we are working uh, along the Scottish Government guidelines, because they, they have looked at those as we have. Uh, we also have a very experienced business systems director in place who's implemented changes like this in other organisations uh, successfully, and, and we, we are very carefully monitoring how we're doing that. Now, you've made, you, just a couple. You've uh, made reference to volumes of data being safely, securely and efficiently held. Are you absolutely confident there's no chance of hacking or...? Yeah, but we have... Um, uh, well, everybody remembers the NHS a little earlier this year. That, that was something that we took very, very seriously. We have uh, a security uh, department within our business systems directorate that is actively looking at any um, penetration challenges that might be in, uh, on, ongoing. For instance, this week, I think, there was a US government announcement that there was a potential hack out there that was immediately sprung upon by SQA. So we have an ongoing program to look at the security of our systems. And we, um, we also do penetration testing to make sure that we, um, we are as safe as we possibly can be. Still on resources, on page 11, um, section 2, you state that uh, the National Qualifications Programme announced by the Deputy First Minister will mean further change over the next three years and will also demand significant staff resource and focus. Now, already the scope of what you've been talking about having done here must be taking up considerable staff resources. So can you quantify what you mean by that, um, the significant staff resources? Are you going to need additional Resources. Well, I, as, as we said, we've completed National 5 and now we're, now we're moving on to higher. Um, and this, the resources that have undertaken National 5 will now be moving on to higher. So uh, I, I, we anticipate it to be roughly similar, um, but we cannot be absolutely sure that we wouldn't have to add, add more. But at the moment, so, we think it's roughly similar. So how big is this roaming team that are handling this? Well, um, as, as some, some of the changes that we've made are associated with improvements in quality assurance, for instance, um, and some of the changes are associated with um, the, the additions that we need to undertake the revisions. Uh, the figure that we have for this, I, th I think we can give you the financial number, yeah. which is... Yeah, it, it, um, the actual number, what happened with um, CFE was we took a lot of additional people on over the three years of developing the new qualifications. With the change to the, to the assessments um, of, of the new qualifications, we've retained some of those people, and those people have actually come on to our payroll as opposed to being fixed term um, people or secondees. So there may be surplus to requirements down the line. Well, these are the same people who will work through the assessments, whether it's National 5, higher, or advanced higher. So, we made the decision based on the advice, you know, the, the HR and the legislation advice around the status of these individuals that we should um, move some of them on to our um, permanent payroll. Um, and what was the cost of that? Um, yeah. Sorry, just trying to understand how can, it's affecting what they're going to be doing. Yeah. Can, can I just say that uh, um, we know we started off the, the committee session with National 4. Um, we currently do not have a timeline for National Force, so we anticipate that we will be needing these people for a period yet. Okay. Thank you. Thanks, Colin. Thank you. Uh, Joanne? Okay. <clears throat> Thank you very much. You'll recall um, in last year's discussions, one of the issues that was flagged up was this question of your international work um, and the charges that basically the ability of the organisation to concentrate on its day job is affected by its desire to do international work or work across the rest of the United Kingdom. Um, in your response, you say, and I quote, um, this generates a contribution to SQA's finances, thereby reducing dependency on the public purse. Can that be quantified? 
Yes. It, it's in our um, financial accounts. So what's the actual? What's the actual? So I'm interested to know how um, your international work uh, reduces dependency in the public purse. By how much, oh, right. roughly? Um, I, th there, can I just say that there are multiple reasons why we undertake international work? No, well, and given the, the amount of time we have, I know there's a whole list of reasons you've, you've given in your submission about why it's important, including leadership and being respected across the world and all the rest of it. But the core charge is that the SQA can't do its day job because of, of the work it's doing in relation to getting contracts elsewhere. So maybe you can clarify for me how this happens. You have, what, a business development? section yes you have a contract section yeah well, these and, and are discrete bodies yes. that they, they don't draw on the work of the no. rest of the sq no they don't so staff are not taken from anywhere else in the organization to support business no. development or contracts no we, we uh, when we when we win a contract we bring on contractors to deliver that contract for us when you develop plans or bids for a contract do you draw on expertise beyond your business development and no. contracts group not at all. No, we, we, the, the, only, the only time that would happen with that is if we would have a meeting associated with that. But there, there is no resources that come out and, and work internationally out with the business development teams from that perspective. So the size of the business development team is? Um, I, I'm sorry, I don't have that detail It would be useful to know, A, what its size is and has it grown or reduced? what the size of the SQE staff more generally is, and whether it has grown or reduced. Um, but I do think it would be important for us to know if there's a means of auditing the benefit. Now, if the charge is people have been drawn to this other work, you need to balance that against knowing what the contracts are that you've secured, the cost in securing yes. them, and the cost and benefit of securing them, which are two different things. And I wonder if that information can be made available to the committee. Yes, I, I think that's, that, that's appropriate. I think, I think um, one, of the, one of the things that I'd like to remind the committee is that we also develop qualifications for colleges and for training providers for modern apprenticeships and foundation apprenticeships. And one of the challenges is balancing the national qualifications uh, developments alongside uh, all of the vocational and other qualifications that we are required to deliver for Scotland. Um, Robert's team, for instance, has the responsibility for both vocational and national qualifications. So that blend is also something that is probably um, more of a challenge than um, the international component. Which is, which is core, that's, that's, you accept that that's core business. Yes. Looking for contracts elsewhere would have to be balanced against the benefits of securing them and the yes. amount of finance that comes in. Yes. And not drawing on yes. other yes. people's time and yes. energy within the organisation. And, and that, that forms part of the um, decision-making criteria that we have as to whether or not we would do a contract. Yeah. And, and so what that. would, sorry? So uh, when, when we decide whether we are going to undertake a contract or not, we would look at what the cost-benefit analysis is and whether, it is, whether there is uh, any benefit to SQA to do that. We would not take on something that would not so be beneficial. So there's a process of that, and then yes. there's a, a, a presumably a commercial assessment subsequent to the contract being yes. completed on its yes. benefits. Is that yes. publicly available? Is that available to the committee? Um, we can make we that... We can make available to the committee. It's not publicly available because it's, some of it's obviously commercially. Um, you know, we're, we're bidding for contracts, so mm -hmm. some of it's commercial. But um, we are absolutely confirming that staff are not used from elsewhere in the organisation yeah, to develop um, either proposals for a bid or in delivering that contract. These are discrete to the business development and contracts departments. Yes. 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 The extent of international awarding, which is, which yes. is um, qualifications undertaken by centres overseas, then the, the, the normal approach there is that what we develop for Scotland um, you know, people can pick up and use. So the units and group awards can be used, um, you know, internationally. So, um, you know, the, the focus is that the work we do for the Scottish market, is, if, if other centres want to use it across the world, then, then they can do that. But it's the work that we develop for the Scottish market and for the benefit of Scottish um, candidates that's the primary source. That's a slight, slightly different point, isn't it? That is other folk noticing the good work that SQA is doing and using yeah. it quite different from so, a focus on what you have already said, um, finding a means to contribute to SQA's finances, thereby reducing dependency in the public purse. I mean, one might argue that shouldn't necessarily be your job to have to do that. If your focus is on delivering qualification in Scotland, 
you shouldn't have to find a commercial means for funding it. You don't have a view on that? Would it be better if SQA could simply rely on a public resource to do its job so it doesn't have to do this commercial work? I, I, I think, I think there's, the, there's commercial work, there's international work. I think the, the, the value that we get from working internationally and, and to some extent from undertaking some contracts allows us to learn how to improve what we do in Scotland as well. Uh, there, there are multiple benefits. It, 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 um, it, it allows us to think of different ways of doing things and, and, and to be a bit more innovative. Well, it, it would again be interesting to have some kind of track of where that happened, given at the moment, I think the issue, we'd all accept the SQ, the view of SQ by a lot of um, practitioners in Scotland is sceptical. So it would be interesting to know where there is evidence that this international work has actually improved that reputation within Scotland. But that is something that we can maybe explore further. But any information you can give us around <coughs> the process and the numbers that are involved within the SQE and that side of what we welcome. We can do that. Thank you very much. Gillian, you wanted to come in very briefly on this. A supplementary on that, you, you mentioned about the value of working internationally. Obviously, one of the goals of the, the, the Scottish Government is for the Scottish economy to develop more internationally as well. I was speaking to somebody last night from Edinburgh University but saying that education in Scotland has got very, very good links internationally, which could be taken to in order to uh, improve the economy. It, would that be one of the, the advantages that you would see of, of the work the SQA does internationally? Some of what we do internationally is about um, uh, the, is about supporting universities, for instance. So Stirling University has a follow-on program, for instance, in Oman that follows on from our HND program in Oman, and they get students going into Stirling University actually in country. So it's it's supporting uh, that particular university institution. So on specific occasions, it does do that. Okay, thank you. Okay, well, uh, before we finish, I've just got one. Question. Well, I've got one request, is that if you could write with the details of these NAP4s that are going on to further education, the continuing education, we were talking about uh, the point that Tavish raised, and you says that you knew where they were going uh, when they had sort of left NAP4s. So if you could send us that information, it would mean we would know what the gap was that we were trying to fill. We can write to Deputy First Minister or local authorities or whoever is the most appropriate person to do that one. Okay. Uh, uh, other than that, thank you very much for your attendance and we will now move into private session and wait for the witnesses and gallery to leave before continuing.